I believe that the production of this strategy is a real milestone for our community. So today provides an opportunity for us all to learn more about it and also to discuss how we can all be part of taking it forwards. In a moment, we'll be hearing from the Minister for Science, Research and Innovation, who's going to introduce the strategy and talk about what happens next. We'll then move on to an in conversation section where I'll be discussing some of the key themes in a bit more detail with the Minister and our fantastic panel, which comprises today Dame Otteline Leiser, Chief Executive of UK Research and Innovation, Keaton Shah, Chief Executive of the British Academy, Warren East, CEO of Rolls Royce, and Kelly Veer, Director of Technical Skills and Strategy at the University of Nottingham. We'll then be opening up for audience Q&A, so please do submit your questions at any point during this session and use the voting function as well to help us decide which ones we're going to prioritise. So without further ado, I'm going to now hand over to Amanda, who's going to introduce the strategy. But in doing so, I would really like to thank you, Amanda, for your personal leadership in bringing this strategy to life. Your personal commitment and pa passion for it has really shone through, and I don't think we'd have the strategy that we have without your input. So over to you, Amanda. Oh, th thank you. Thank you to everybody here. Thank you to all of you who are with us today. It really is the most amazing, amazing thing to do, and to celebrate the publishing of the uh, publication of the R&D People and Culture Strategy. So it's just, I'm very excited, as you can probably tell. And it's so fantastic to really have this opportunity. And if you do get a chance, um, maybe you can hashtag recruit reward retain because that would be really great to get that across all of social media platforms and we can see exactly what you and your organizations are doing to work towards the strategy aims and to hear really importantly your thoughts on this so Hayat has just quickly had a run through of the event and how it's going to unfold and basically what we'll do is, as soon as I've just finished doing introductory remarks is it's over to you so really if you have any questions any thoughts on how we really bring this alive then then please do let us know so just briefly I'd just like to go over a few things I I am delighted to welcome you here today uh, with you to celebrate the launch of the R&D People and Culture Strategy. And it's wonderful to talk to you and have representation from across the breadth of the R&D sector here. Uh, we were talking earlier with the team and we've got not-for-profit organisations, we've got businesses, we've got so many different organisations. So it's just really delighted to see all of you. I want to start with a few words on why we are here today and the importance of this occasion. And when the government published its R&D roadmap last year, we set out our bold and ambitious vision, ambitious vision to really make the UK a global science superpower and the premier destination for people who work in R&D to live and pursue their careers. And in, this time, in the time that we published the roadmap, our appreciation for the vital importance of science research and innovation has only grown and the wonderful work that's been done to fight against the pandemic only really emphasizes the importance of a strong R&D ecosystem and I am confident that R&D will be vital to ensuring that we really are successful in building back better from the impacts of COVID-19. But honestly, to build back better successfully, we really do need to make sure that every single person working in R&D is valued, from scientists and technicians putting at the cutting edge of new developments, to people working in social sciences, arts and culture, and that we ensure that we remain creative and innovative, and every single person is vital. The government also published uh, last week the innovation strategy, and the R&D people and culture strategy really complements the innovation strategy by setting out how we will achieve our ambitions for the R&D workforce. This will be key for supporting the government's vision to make the UK a global hub for innovation by 2035. So most important to me, however, is putting people at the heart of our great R&D. And I am passionate about the talent, the drive and the creativity of many people and teams working across the UK doing inspirational things every day. And as your Minister for Science, Research and Innovation, I've heard loud and clear that there are long-standing issues surrounding people and culture within our R&D sector. And I know the pandemic has brought these into sharp relief. And that is why, as we build back better, I want this to be the moment that we build on the great work being done by so many incredible people and institutions and create a lasting change that I know that we all want to see. The R&D People and Culture Strategy puts people at the heart of our great R&D and sets out how to plan to recruit talented people across all of the great roles that we have, how we reward them with a positive, diverse and inclusive working culture and also retain them from the benefit of the economy and society. 
However, I also recognise this is not a change that we can achieve with just a flick of a switch or that government can make happen by itself. It's going to take cooperation, sustained effort from everybody, government, funders, industry, academia, and everyone as individuals to bring the ambitions of the strategy to reality. And I really believe we must all buy into a whole sector vision for change. And that is why I'm so delighted that we're publishing the R&D People and Culture Strategy and celebrating its publication today. The strategy sets out a vision and calls for the sector to take action. And I would like us to go on this journey today. Today is just the start. So let's work together uh, to make it a reality. And I really hope that you enjoy the event. Hi, Artem, back to you. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Amanda. I think your enthusiasm really shines through. And that's a very helpful piece of framing for today's discussion. Um, before we kick off our In Conversation segment, let's take a quick look at a short video. My mum was a lab technician until she got married and then, and then left, because that's what happened in those days. But what I want to do is make sure that we have longevity of career, that we enable those careers, that people just feel fulfilled from all the things, the great opportunities that we have in science. Well, I, I think that might have been a slightly different video than one I was there, but we can, we can just... I wasn't that. expecting that, that's fine then. <laughs> well, that's fine. So, but the question I wanted to ask you is, I think one of the things that you've talked personally about, quite, um, you know, referencing your own personal experience, has been the fact that your, your mother, I think, was a lab technician, and that she actually gave up her career because in those days, raising a family meant that that's what you did. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested to know, what do you um, believe the strategy is going to do to help those of us who have family, other caring responsibilities, how, how do you hope the strategy is going to help create a, a more level playing field for people with those additional responsibilities? And more broadly, how do you hope we're going to use the strategy to create a really inclusive culture across the R&D workforce? Gosh, is that just one question? <laughs> and hopefully, you know, we're all going to, to chip in on this. Uh, I guess, uh, yes, you're right. You know, my mum, she was a lab technician and I'm I'm 60 now. So it was a long time ago when, when my mum sort of had me and she would have been, she was 21 at the time. And in those days, you really didn't pursue a career. It was really, you you, you gave up and, uh, and I feel actually genuinely, it was such a waste of this beautiful, amazing talent talent that she could have really given to the R&D sector. So the, the, the way that we're, we're, the strategy is going to work will really be supportive of having careers. It will be supportive of cross from academia to business. I think that's a really important thing. It will be recognising that actually we do have children <laughs> as well and it'll be really making sure that we support um, all levels in terms of um, uh, academia in research in r and um, in, in everything really and the biggest thing I would say is um, for me it's about having confidence and I think if we start now to really instill confidence in people then it will really establish uh, something for the future. However, the reality is we need to start now and make a difference in five or ten years' time. This isn't going to be an instant fix, but we do have a responsibility, I believe, to, to be making that, that, that start now. Absolutely. And actually, the, the segment that we just saw, you talked about the importance of um, all R&D roles being accessible. And, and Otley, this is something you've been very vocal about. Um, what's you, what, what do you see the strategies doing to help make sure that people can understand and feel that that full breadth of R&D roles is relevant to them. And more generally, it would be useful to also hear a bit more about how UKRI is taking forward the key themes of the strategy. Another big question. Absolutely. No, so this is something that is incredibly important to me, and I've been I'm so excited about this strategy but precisely because this is really, as you say, a moment in time, a really um, yeah, key point to focus us all on, on delivering this much more inclusive and open research and innovation system that we need. If we're going to use research and innovation at, as the core of our economy, because that's where the UK really shines through, we have to make sure that that's a, a fully inclusive system. And one of the really exciting things about research and innovation are, is the extraordinary range of roles available in that system. We tend to think 
instantly of, of, of you know kind of people in white coats rattling test tubes with bubbling liquids that's a tiny tiny proportion of the people we need those people they're very important people but also there's everything that goes around those people um, uh, to make the system work so whoever you are wherever you are there is a role in the research and innovation system in an innovation driven economy for you and it's an exciting role that will match your aspirations and that's a, a really key message for people who are currently think of themselves as outside the system and it not being for them so there we have to get right into schools with things like the STEM ambassadors program and our 101 jobs campaign where we're really trying to highlight um, the diversity of roles through example um, that, that there are in the system but also for people who do think of themselves as being in the research and innovation system we, we have a very um, a, a remarkably kind of parochial idea of, of what a career looks like in that system and there are such a wide range of opportunities for people you have trained in research and innovation to take up that incredible diversity of roles that matches their changing aspirations as they go through their lives. And I think um, a, a key part of that confidence that Amanda spoke about um, comes from the realization of the, the breadth of opportunities. A lot of the anxiety people currently suffer from, I think, comes from thinking that they have this very narrow opportunity. And if they don't manage to kind of squeeze through that narrow gate they'll, that they've lost, when the range of possibilities is so wide. So bringing all of those things together, we need to open everybody's eyes to the diversity of skills and talents that we need um, to, to create the system that is very much um, kind of by the people and for the people. And we at UKRI have a key role to play, um, both in terms of how we uh, uh, assess and reward a whole range of activities across the system, but also in terms of how we help the community more generally to identify and share that good practice and all of those things i think are highlighted in the in the strategy it, it's a start we need to start somewhere and i really want to start now great um Otley, that's that's really powerful thank you so we're going to drill down a bit further into this issue of all roles in the ecosystem but let's have another go at quick video okay <laughs> <laughs> <Fingers crossed. laughs> oh. the technicians are such a crucial role I don't think a lot of the field work could happen because we as technicians we don't just look after the equipment and make it especially when we're making something we're also thinking about the ergonomics will it break the physical properties of what we're doing it will it last in the environment we're doing it that sort of thing it's not just go there you go and it work but the work goes behind all that to get to that point it can be quite long and Technical. I work on a day-to-day -day basis involves organizing for meetings, for workshops, for conferences, organizing for travel and other logistics and uh, procurement. Anything that they need for the project to succeed, I facilitate. So Kelly, one of my pet hates is the idea of the lone genius model. You know, we should all be deeply indebted to that one person, I could say often a man, in a white lab coat who made that breakthrough that benefits all of us. And that video shows, and we all know, all of us who know who work in the R&D ecosystem know that's not the reality. So there are so many different people who are involved across the R&D ecosystem and who each contribute. Do you think the strategy has said enough about how we're going to capture all that talent and make sure that we do move towards a culture where that diversity of contribution is valued. What more would you like to see happening? Well, firstly, I love that clip. I just think it begins to give such a great insight into the many traditionally hidden roles that we, as we've spoken about that make up you know, this fantastic ecosystem which we all work in. You know, Ivy is a great example of an administrator who enables research. You know, that team would not be able to deliver that research without Ivy. And Ian is a technician like myself. I've been a technician at the University of Nottingham for 20 years. Technicians are absolutely vital to research and innovation. You know, we're advancing technologies, developing methodologies, you know, and actually training the researchers of the future too. Um, and so for me, the People and Culture Strategy presents a really fantastic opportunity to recognise all these roles. And it was really important for me that this strategy did recognise everyone, and I believe it does. 
it provides a mandate for positive change for all from you know apprentice technician as i was back sort of 22 years ago but all the way through to professor and i think that's really key um i was also really pleased to see that it encourages a new pipeline of technical talent again into all roles there really is a career for everybody in the sector but these careers are hidden at present so i'm really excited to see how we can shine a light on those career pathways moving forwards um and i'm really excited about you know the vision it presents and the blueprint for change and and to be honest we're already starting to see some change you know we're seeing technicians um as one example you know my community mentions now in government policy and strategy and actually that's a really rare thing you know in my 22 years of being a technician and even the fact that i'm sitting with colleagues here today i think it's really you know an important you know signifier of how the strategy really aims to you know recognize everyone in the whole team of course, it is only the first step. Um, and so for it to be effective, we do need everybody to get behind it and everybody to play that part. I'm really excited about how the technical community can play their part through the various initiatives that we have underway at the moment. And of course, you know, investment to realize some of the ambitions in the strategy will also be key moving forward. But I think it really does provide, you know, an excellent basis for us to move forward to ensure the UK really is at the innovation, you know, the forefront of innovation and discovery and that people are at the heart of that too. Thank you, Kelly. And um, I agree, it was really great to see Ian and, and Ivy in that video. And actually, we're getting some nice comments coming through. So Stephen Franey talked about how delighted he is to see technical staff recognised in the report and the, finally getting the recognition and the visib visibility they deserve. And that's that's a comments getting a lot of thumbs up. It would be great to have even more questions coming through. We've got some really good ones there that we'll come to once we've given all the panellists a chance to say uh, a few words. Um, so please do keep adding your, your comments and questions there and we'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, but I'd now like to talk about a different group that sometimes uh, may not feel they are always fully included. And I'm going to turn to Heaton Shah, who is the Chief Exec of the British Academy. And Heaton, there's a lot of emphasis um, in our community on the STEM disciplines. And of course, the British Academy is focused on arts, humanities and social science. I think we're now calling these shape subjects. So these all play massively important roles in our ecosystem in areas as diverse as AI, creative industries or net zero uh, aspirations. How can we make sure that all parts of the R&D ecosystem feel included and actually work together effectively to deliver the outcomes that we're seeking? Well, thanks so much for having me here today. Uh, and I agree. I mean, the UK, I think, is uniquely strong across a range of STEM and shape disciplines. And I think as we're thinking about becoming a research superpower, that's one of the key strengths that we ought to lean into. I mean, look back at, uh, you know, what we've just seen from uh, the pandemic. Science gave us the vaccine, but it was the social science and humanities which helped us think about how to deal with vaccine hesitancy. Uh, we talked about the innovation strategy earlier and again when we think about the pandemic uh, we've seen we've needed innovation from epidemiologists but also from engineers and from economists so we're much stronger when all the disciplines work together and actually i think you know that the last few months and years have really proven that uh, in, in terms of our response to the pandemic and you just mentioned ai I think that's a really good example of where STEM and shape disciplines will need to work together into the future. So that I think is uh, very much on the table. When it comes to the people and culture strategy itself, uh, I mean, we at the British Academy really welcome this. Uh, uh, and let me also uh, congratulate the minister and thank her for her personal commitment, because I think it's very clear, it's been really you, Amanda, who has made this happen and your personal interest in this. So thank you from you know all of our community to you for that. Um, we, we are very affected by people and culture issues. Nearly half of academic staff in UK universities belong to shaped disciplines. Uh, and our disciplines can help cast light on these issues because, you know, we are the disciplines of people uh, studying culture, studying incentives and so on, psychology, sociology, anthropology and so on. So to some extent, we can help cast light on the issues. But also, I think one of the key things is that, and I think the, the strategy recognises this, that there are multiple research cultures. These issues don't play out in the same way across all disciplines. Uh, and I think the strategy is helpful in taking an iterative approach where we share best practice with one another and can learn. So, for example, you know, shape researchers are often not working in a lab environment in a team, but in an archive or library, often on their own. So they may face a different set of issues to do with, say, isolation, et cetera, et cetera. 
The National Academies have been thinking a lot about early career researchers, and you know, I think it really comes across how insecure some of uh, the, 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 their contracts and their lives are at the moment. We're working together to set up a young academy, which will give them a, a stronger voice. And the British Academy itself has, with the support of the Wilson Foundation, set up an early career research network as well. So we're trying to bring together that community uh, to, to really focus on uh, the importance of the pipeline for the future. But it feels to me there's, there's a series of shared challenges which go beyond whether you're shape or STEM. Uh, I mean, a couple just come to mind. One, one is creating the right incentives uh, to, to support the most marginalized, some, some of the people who don't even get into the research system. But th these will cost, I think. Uh, and that's why I think it's so helpful that this uh, People and Culture Strategy has been published just before what will probably be quite a tight spending review so that we can really show that this is something that we all collectively want to invest in. Another area I think is there's a real need for Bayes and the Department for Education to work together on this agenda. Uh, you know, those two portfolios used to sit together previously, uh, and now it's all the more important to think about the whole system as we've been discussing. Uh, you know, universities were only mentioned four or five times in the strategy, and so it's really important to kind of link up to DfE and say, we, we need to talk to you, you have a role to play in all of this as, as well as Bayes. But let me end by just saying, you know, one of the key things in the strategy which I really welcome is the focus on leadership, and it will require leadership, not just from government, but from everyone within the system, including ourselves. And let me pay tribute to, you know, some of the people who are around this virtual table today, or, well, you're not virtual, but I am, so you're virtual to me, uh, in particular, Ottoline and, and you, Hayatun, who are genuinely system leaders thinking about things, not just from a narrow you know, self-interested perspective, organizational institu institutional perspective, but genuinely thinking about what is right for the whole system. Uh, and it's with leadership like yours that gives me optimism for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Heaton. Well, that was unexpected, but <laughs> um, very kind of you to say so. But actually some, some really important inputs there um, across a whole range of issues. I hope we'll be able to come back to in the discussion. Heaton, stay with us. You are there virtually, but we want you round our table, virtual or otherwise. Um, but I'm going to now ask my colleagues to try and share the final video before I turn to Warren. So could we have that final video, please? Research is really important because it informs how we interact with the complex world around us. And if we look at the fundamental scientific method of observing the world, coming up with a research question and hypothesis, doing experiments to test those things, collecting data, analyzing it, coming to conclusions and communicating the findings to the wider world, there's a huge amount of parallels to the process that is required to create a, a novel startup. Great. So Warren, we just heard Dr. Ruth Weir talking about the link between research and entrepreneurship. And the strategy acknowledges the opportunity that's there to provide greater mobility between these different sort of subsectors in R&D to uh, often use the term to increase the permeability of that membrane between, for example, industry and academia, but it applies to government, entrepreneurship and so forth. And I would like to get your thoughts on what we're doing well in this area and what you would like to see us doing so that we can up our game even further when it comes to mobility and collaboration across those different sectors within R&D. Yeah, okay, well, um, well, thanks for having me as, uh, as part of it. Um, and, and actually, thanks to having, having Rolls-Royce as part of the, the, the team that was, was working on the strategy. Um, and that's important for us because you know we do exploit that some of that permeability uh, that you talk about um, for for our business, uh, and I think some of the um, some of what actually works well is um, is collaboration between industry and uh, academia. It doesn't work well uniformly across the piece, but we have some some very good examples. And um, we were talking in, in reception uh, about uh, a team at Nottingham University that, that works with Rolls-Royce, and that's on our um, 
our next generation of, uh, of engine, uh, and that's an important engine. It's, it's going to be much more efficient and, uh, than, than previous things. First major change in architecture probably for 50 or 60 years. Uh, and, and that has necessitated some, some really difficult uh, engineering stuff that just hasn't been done before, stuff that has required some fundamental uh, science uh, to, uh, to go into it. And um, you know, we have, as part of that project, collaborated with, um, with, with Nottingham. We've actually collaborated with 17 different universities uh, around the UK, um, brought in um, uh, advanced manufacturing research centres, and they do convening and, and, and work some of this permeability between academia and, and industry. And a company like Rolls Royce can then work with some of the 280 or so smaller businesses that have, have been associated with that. So there are areas where it works well. And, you know, I think to, uh, to, to improve on, on the permeability, we should study those areas, what works well and what doesn't work so well. Having a, a very defined need is, um, it helps helps galvanize and get people working together. So, you know, we could have done the research that's done, and I keep referring to, to Kelly and the and research in Nottingham, because it's a very convenient example, and we happen to be sitting next to each other. But, um, you know, that could have been done um, in abstract over, over many years. But having the very tangible goal of solving, uh, solving a real problem certainly helped it. You know, this morning, um, uh, this morning, of course, we were hearing about a billion doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine being uh, being delivered uh, around the world. Well, AstraZeneca couldn't have done that without the Oxford team, and the Oxford team couldn't have um, delivered their vaccine without without AstraZeneca. Uh, and there was a a real Im impelling need uh, that has enabled that collaboration to. Uh, to, to work well and, and deliver results. So I think that's where we need to look and explore for how to improve the permeability. Thank you, Warren, and very convenient that <laughs> you and Kelly had that conversation yes. ahead of this. Um, <laughs> great case study material. Uh, so I think this issue of permeability might well come up in our in our broader Q&A, um, but we've actually got, we're accumulating some great questions from our audience. So I'd love to put some of those to you. And our top rated question um, is a really important one. So I'm going to start with you, Amanda. Okay. But actually, I think if any of the other panellists want to come in and, and heat and you might just need to be a bit assertive and speak <laughs> 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 or wave at me or something, and I'll try to make sure we catch you. Um, I think it's worth us dwelling on this a bit and it is a top rated question as well. So it's from Sophie Inger. I think that's how you pronounce your surname. Sorry Sophie if I got that wrong. One criticism of the strategy is that it ignores key research culture issues. For example it does not include the words racism, bias, prejudice and discrimination. So she's asking you know why what's the response to that and what do we plan to do in this area and as someone who's been in many of the discussions that uh, led to the development of the strategy I can certainly give the headline, which is the strategy absolutely does not shy away from those issues. So language is important, but I think all of us who were involved in its development would be um, horrified if it didn't actually make a difference in those areas. But let's drill down a bit further. So Amanda, do you want mm. to kick off and then yes. maybe Ottilie and I'll come to you next. Yes, yeah. <clears throat> if anyone else wants to join, please feel free to. Oh, absolutely. And I think it's a really um, important question. And um, I think it's probably worthwhile just reflecting back on how the people in culture strategies actually evolved. And one of the things we really wanted to do was make sure that we were really inclusive of how we came to develop the people in culture strategy. And that was around lots and lots of stakeholder engagement. And we had a steering committee, which I know uh, you're, you're referring to, but also we had lots of roundtables. We really reached out to all different communities to reflect reflect exactly what, what is needed and we're certainly not backing away from anything but I guess what what is important to to recognize though is that this is the strategy that identifies and makes the start point to where we need to go and so this is a journey that has just started for me it's not a completed journey and it's really important in, uh, in, in terms of 
we don't just have a shiny document. I know we haven't got a document in front of us actually, but we don't just have this document. It needs to actually really deliver what it says on, on in, within the content. And so therefore, some of the things that we're going to be doing is we're going to be thinking about how we actually implement the really important things that are within, within the strategy. And as an example, we're thinking about bullying and harassment because that's a really important thing we need to think about. But clearly as well, we'll be thinking about diversity and inclusion because that is something that we need to think about and and we will welcome uh, imports still on the journey as well and then uh, and, and lots of other topics as well so we absolutely do recognize the challenges um, and we're definitely not shying away from them this is the start of the journey we have no intention whatsoever of, of backing off this is about people this is about culture mm -hmm. and we need to today is the start point to change to changing and really get a clear direction where we need to go thank you Amanda and Ottilie your thoughts Yes, uh, uh, this is a, a crucial issue. You, you can look, for example, at the um, award data for UKI grants, which we publish now um, every year and broken down by a, a range of categories. And you can see um, really strong underrepresentation of um, some uh, groups, for example, black people, which is, is really upsetting because the skills and talents of those people and the different perspectives that people from different backgrounds bring in are absolutely crucial for that creative dynamic system that we want we have to welcome in people from um, with a whole range of different backgrounds and perspectives and uh, to me one of the kind of ironies almost of the drive to try to make things fair has has been to narrow down the things that we assess and consider valuable to things that are kind of easy to count and measure and compare mm -hmm. and so we, we we put an awful lot of emphasis on you know uh, the exact grades you've got in your university for example and uh that actually um embeds a, a narrow view of who should for example be accepted onto a phd course whereas um what I think is really important is, is to welcome in a much wider range of people. So people who have, for example, um, worked in a range of roles across um, the, the sector and gained direct practical experience and now think it's a good time in their career to come into a PhD. So we need much wider range of routes in and to value and recognize a much wider range of um, uh, indicators of your suitability to, to to conduct research and so one of the key tools from that point of view at UKRI is we're introducing the, a, a much more narrative CV called the resume for researchers built on the model that the Royal Society uh, developed and the, the idea behind that is to give people a much wider range of opportunity to demonstrate how they've contributed to research and innovation but also crucially those other really important skills people bring into the system so how they work in teams how they value the people around them it's important to develop those how they contribute to the wider research system to make sure that that um, all the activities that you need for that highly creative system are supported and valued and also how they interact with that much wider range of stakeholders so to generate the kind of porosity that we see all four of those areas are crucial and there are so many different ways that you can demonstrate your contribution and we need to help everybody across the, the sector to, to recognize those different contributions to find ways to assess and fairly compare applications for example from people who come from very different backgrounds they could all fill out that form they can provide very different evidence but it is comparable in a transparent and clear way and that's where that's the, that's where we need to move we need to let go of the kind of security blanket of assessment metrics that we've used into that much more nuanced high quality system that we uh, that will um, support that full diversity of talents that we need it's very important thank you Ottilie. um i don't know Hita, if you want to come in i know you've done work in this area and then if warren or kelly you want a quick comment please feel free to let me know thanks heaton yeah thank you no i i mean it's it's really uh important and um I, I mean at the british academy we're trying to improve things like our data collection we're reviewing the mechanisms by which we assess grants so for example shifting the way that rather than seeing the name and the university first you read the proposal first uh, and, and just try trying different techniques as it were at that kind of micro level to see what could de-bias the way that uh, we, we we review applications etc but there are much wider questions for us at a sort of system level you know who are the people that get onto the advisory groups etc which 
uh, help shape these strategies, as it were. And I think we all need to sort of keep being really self-critical and thinking, what are the mechanisms by which we bring people to the table and give voice to, to, to different perspectives? Uh, and at the same time, you know, within our own institutions, there's the sort of flip side problem, which is you don't just make this, uh, you know, a problem for the, the minorities, as it were. Everybody's got to take that on, as it were. So uh, it, it, it's not easy to do, but I do think uh, it, 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 it's right that we all focus on it. And uh, I think, as Amanda says, that this strategy, you, you know, before this strategy, people and culture wasn't really a focus at that level. And this now gives us a space in which to have this uh, as a sort of continuing dialogue. And I see the strategy as kind of holding that space as, as, as a really important first step. Thank you, Heaton. Um, there are lots of questions here. Um, are you happy for me to keep going or did you want to Fine, okay. And, and the last comment for me using, exploiting my chair position just for a second, um, but this is something I'm also very, very passionate about. You know, I think that you know, we have to hold our hands up and say that the R&D community has been too slow to embrace these issues uh, around diversity and inclusion, and that absolutely includes all the words that Sophie referenced. Um, but the people and culture strategy for me marks the first time that we have at the highest level of the profession or the professions that make up our community said, we embed a vision of diversity and inclusive culture into what we think excellence looks like. That's a huge step forward. And many of us, work in this area, the academy has been running an engineering um, community focused diversity inclusion program for many years. We have just uh, published the Hamilton Commission with Lewis Hamilton looking at the representation of black people in UK motorsport. There are lots of great initiatives out there. What we need to do is to work much more collaboratively to get the best of all of those and to create critical mass and tangible change, measurable change. So the people in culture strategy can't do all of that, but it's the first time we've had that shared framework to enable that to happen. So I am, I think it's a really important step forward. Um, so I'm going to now go to the next question, which is from Leslie Patterson. And Leslie, if it's a Leslie, I know, hello, Leslie. Um, there is so much to be hopeful for We the People in Culture Strategy. Uh, and what Leslie welcomes folks and technicians as well as researchers. But she says that one group that seems to be missing in lots of research culture plans and initiatives is professional services staff who are integral and can experience the same negative or difficult research cultures. So in what way will this cohort be included in plans? And actually, I'm going to start at the other end of the table here. So Kelly, I don't know if you want to share any thoughts from a university perspective. I think actually, Warren, there's something there for you too. And if yeah. Amanda or um, Otley want to come in as well, please feel free to start with Kelly. Sure. Um, so speaking from a personal perspective, obviously I'm a technician, work with some fantastic professional services colleagues, and there's many of the challenges are very similar. And um, something we've put in place across the technical community is an initiative called the Technician Commitment, which has four key pillars. Um, the Technician Commitment is all about advancing visibility, recognition, career development, and sustainability of these crucial roles. But of course, you know, those pillars are much wider than just the technical community. And I think, you know, work to advance visibility, recognition, career pathways, and sustainability of, you know, professional services, you know, skills and expertise is equally as key. Um, and we're really looking forward to sort of broadening out some of those initiatives to absolutely be inclusive of all roles that support and enable research. That's really good to hear. Thanks, Kelly. And Warren? Yeah, um, well, I was delighted to hear the question, actually, because um, you know, Rolls-Royce is a, is a business that uh, that is about turning um, research and innovation into, uh, into products and services that make life a bit better. Uh, and so, you know, typically, it's a bit like those sort of heroes in white coats, the uh, the, the heroic engineers that, that do that tends to be um, tend to be amplified, mm -hmm. and and those that support within an organisation tends to be diminished. And you know, I've observed this not just in Rolls Royce, but in my previous career in a in a different sector, um, but in the same sort of uh, in, within the world of engineering. Um, and as the, the the business leader, of course, it's very frustrating because you know. That, uh, that in reality, um, the heroes you know, can't do it all on their own. And um, you know, in, in business, it's, it's, it's much sharpened um, because uh, you know, we, we do have to make all the, all, all the finances work. We do have to look after um, all, all of our people and we rely on those, um, those, those parts of the organization which, which don't often get, um, get so much visibility. 
uh, and you know I think it's 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 very important we look after them from a business point of view um, it, it's very important to, across the um, research and innovation sector as a whole absolutely and Amanda did you want to add anything to that if, if, I, if I may just just briefly I mean well one of the um, one of the major concerns when we were thinking about people in culture strategy was actually obviously thinking about people and one of the ways that you really ensure that everybody feels valued is by having excellent leadership and just making sure that within within that 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 people um, feel valued feel rewarded they're not bullied they're not harassed that, that actually it's a really important good working environment good culture and so and it's a challenge I have to say I mean it's something that, that you know we, we, we've had many conversations about is around really um, thinking about what leadership should look like how it gets the best out of people and it's also about recognizing all the different talents that people have and actually then being happy at the levels that they, they choose to be at and this this is where I think leadership gets so incredibly incredibly complicated but it just reminds me why we have to do the people and culture strategy and somebody said and I think I think it was uh, um, one, one of the meetings why are we doing the people and culture strategy and it's because it's the right thing to do it's because it's the right thing to do for everybody who really works in our amazing R&D system. So I just wanted to, to say that, you know, there's lots of things we can be fair, we can be decent to each other, but actually I think we all have a responsibility to follow that through. I know probably after then you've got something to say on that as well. I do actually, uh, what I'd like to say very briefly on this, it gets back to this other thing that's in the strategy and is really important, which is about bureaucracy. So uh, there's a lot of concern about excessive bureaucracy in the research innovation system. We absolutely need to, to um, ensure that the system, the administrative um, operations around the system work really well and and the the danger with the sort of negative spin on bureaucracy is we forget that really good work requires fantastic bureaucrats I mean, that's who you need really high quality people working with the system in the system to ensure that it works as smoothly as possible and I think um, our crucial dependency on all of those people in, I mean, right across the system is is really 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 important so i think we need to um absolutely crack down on unnecessary bureaucracy but do it in a way that recognizes the extraordinary role of high quality bureaucrats in delivering the work that we need to deliver great well i'm going to stick with you Ottiline. um i've got a specific question for you and then i'm going to put a more, much broader question to, to the panel uh, at large the specific question for you is that it's from tim softly and he says the document talks about a new deal for postgraduate research students uh, what is that? What does it mean? And how's it going to <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, um, uh, well, that, at, at, at a, a key level, that the crucial question is, what is that? I mean, we need to have a really broad discussion about that in, the con in a variety of contexts, I think. Um, uh, partly, as I was saying before, we need to make sure that that research training route is open to a much wider range of people. So how do we, how do we create that? wide door for people to come in and then um, that influences quite heavily the the models through which we support and fund that and there are a number and they are quite hotly contested and um, so for example at the moment most of the UKRI funded PhD students work through um, doctoral training centres that build a cohort of students quite often focused in a particular area that has a huge number of advantages but some people would um, prefer a, a system that's more um, a link to individual research groups, for example. And then there is the very long running and thorny question of whether PhD students should be students or employees. And there are advantages and disadvantages to both of those things. Um, and then, you know, there are more fundamental questions about how many do we need um, and how much should they be paid and to what extent are, is the uh, um, relatively low pay for those people, a disincentive to the diversity of people we would like to come into the system. So there are a, a large number of questions and we will be um, uh, continuing a very deep and wide consultation to try to understand what the solution are to all of those questions um, to get the right range of, of activity, diversity, skills and talents and built up to feed in right across that wider research system. So that, of course, is the other key element is that those people with PhDs are crucial right across the economy. It's not just for one particular set of jobs. So we will be con con consulting very widely on that over the year. And um, I hope very much that the 
people um, listening and, and all of their friends and relations will contribute to that so well, consultation. That's, that's something well worth looking out for. Uh, so my much broader question is, I'm going to come be ambitious here and combine two questions, one from Cassandra Gould van Praag and one from Jackie Proven. And this is really getting to one of the, I would say, big potential tensions, um, which is on the one hand, we're saying we want to have this, um, we want to talk about top talent, we want to talk about excellence. And on the other hand, we're talking about, we want this to be inclusive, we want everyone to have to be involved. So Cassandra's focusing on um, the, the focus on, on, sorry, Cassandra's question is focused on competition being a framing that inherently drives cultural challenges um, rather than saying, well, we're all working together to try to make a difference to society. And Jackie's talking about the fact that on the one hand, we've got language around high potential route and top universities. And on the other hand, we're, we're talking about trying to have a culture that's attractive and, and open to all. So um, I'm going to start with you, Amanda, if you're happy oh, to kick off. But I'd actually like all of our panelists to say something about this because I think it's another one of the really important issues at the heart of it. So I'll probably come to Heaton after you, Amanda. Sure. Just heads up, Heaton. Sure. <laughs> um, so this is, um, I, I think this goes to the heart really of why we need a people and culture strategy. And um, whilst recognising this can't be something to everyone, I think we are ambitious enough to hope that it actually does do something for everybody that that that's where i would really like like to do this and this is why the engagement that we have is just so important that this is um this is the the foundation this is the start point but i don't i really don't see it, as i've said before it see it see it stopping here and it is about recognizing high potential and, and high art and you know i i'm a great believer in in recognizing potential as you know you know i didn't get any qualifications and look here i am as minister of science it's absolutely incredible but there are because there are different talents that we can nurture different talents that we need to, to recognize but this isn't going to be easy i mean we're not for one second saying this is going to be, be easy at all but it does need to be doing all of those things um which which is why it's really important that we we really focus on on how we, we deliver those i'm happy to come back at the end as well i, do, I am keen to let Keaton come in but i have lots of thoughts on why this is just so important that we we do do this one of the things i suppose a final part is that we cannot do this in isolation and i think it's been mentioned before but it is about working with education as an example you know it's really important that we do that it is about making sure that we are working with industry we are working with academia as well and it's all of that working together and recognizing the value that this strategy will do but enough for me for the minute sorry i could go on as you know well, you'll get the last word at the end of the session about this, so whatever we get to cover you can try and um, make sure we leave those with those thoughts so heaton please do share your ideas well, well, thank you. And, and I agree. I, I think this, this is a fair uh, tension to surface. It's a good set of questions that people have asked. Uh, and I might sort of answer it at two levels. The first is to say, I think you can resolve the tension to some extent. So, for example, in, in a way, what the people and culture strategy is uh, sort of forcing us to do is to ask questions of, do, is our notion of excellence the right one? should it be broadened out in, in particular ways, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and I think to some extent you can resolve that dynamic by saying, ha having a wider notion of excellence, which thinks about diversity in a, in a range of ways, including diversity of, uh, of thought, uh, you know, can to some extent deal with that tension. But, but I think that there's a, there's a kind of higher level question, which in a way uh, is really big picture. And in a way it wasn't the job of this strategy to deal with but it does i think butt up against you know what's the overall system within which you're working uh, and what are the incentives for example through the ref or how higher education is funded etc cetera, etc cetera. And, and those are really big dynamics which i don't think a strategy like this could resolve but can point to uh, and i think you know in some ways you know it, it's just fair for the the, the the people in the audience to be asking how, how does that work out? I mean, I think the question of, you know, how is IHE system funded it is a really important one and will set the parameters for how then people and culture feel within it. Thank you, Heaton. That's very helpful. 
Um, Kelly, would you like to offer some thoughts on this? Just briefly, actually, Heaton's made the point I was going to say. Um, I think it comes down to how we define excellence and what excellent means to us. And I think what this strategy offers is a new way to start a number of conversations about that. Um, and I think moving forward, that's going to be really exciting. Thank you, Kelly. I'll just keep working my way along. So, Warren? Yeah, um, I agree. It's um, it, it, it feels like a trade-off, but it shouldn't be a trade-off. Um, and, you know, we have exactly the same thing within an organisation and I'm sure within all of our, our organisations where um, it's perhaps useful to think about, you know, why are we why are we doing this as an organization uh, and in our case as a business it's pretty easy you know it, it's a competitive world out there um perhaps perhaps nationally um we we want to be better at research and innovation um than uh, the, than other parts of the world so that we do better for our, our our people um and when you introduce that that sort of third variable into the trade-off uh then then it, it helps put that trade-off in perspective and say that actually, you know, they're, they're bound up in the same thing in the pursuit of the same objective. Um, top talent, yes. Excellence, yes. Inclusivity, absolutely, because you know that delivers the most competitive, um, competitive uh, body of people um, to to address the challenges. So um, I don't really see it ultimately as a trade-off. Thank you. Uh, I, I imagine, Oslin, you agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, there are a number of reasons why it gets uh, flagged often as a trade-off. And um, all the evidence suggests it's completely the opposite from a trade-off and that you get much better productivity and, and, and delivery and creativity and all of those things out of diversity with collaboration rather than the kind of competition that drives people apart with sharp elbows. So I think um, uh, there are a number of ways to, to think about this. One of them actually comes down to that lone genius model we talked about. I think we have a tendency in the research innovation system to map everything down onto individuals. So if we talk about competition, it becomes competition between individuals. When, um, you know, to me, it's us versus climate change. Um, it's, it's, you know, us versus the big problems in the world. That's what we're competing um, to, to, to win. And we need that diversity with really effective collaboration to, to deliver it. And we need to think much more broadly about our system. So of course, within the system, there will also always be competition. There's limited resources, there are a limited number of ideas, but how are we best going to deliver on you know, the key goals for the nation that is about funding diversity with collaboration in a really intelligent and thoughtful way um, at, the, at the right kind of level, diversity in the sorts of institutions we find, diversity in the sorts of people we find, diversity in the sorts of teams, sorts of approaches, sorts of disciplines. So we need to think hard portfolio wise and I, I hope our colleagues in Treasury who are economists and therefore experts at portfolio management really understand that value of a diverse portfolio. I think we all we all hope that, Ottilie. <laughs> I've, I've said this before, but I, I will just say it again because it's still relevant that I think in many parts of business, it's now really well established that the evidence base for the value of diverse teams working in inclusive cultures, and inclusive cultures just mean places where all voices are heard, everyone's welcome, you get the best out of everybody. Um, but the, the evidence base, whether it's about talent attraction, retention, motivation, productivity, health and safety, the ability to produce competitive project, uh, products that reach different markets, there is such a clear evidence base that we've sort of moved on in many sectors from, from this as a, as a debate, you know, that is, that is what you want to have as your hallmarks if you want to be successful. And I think it's fantastic that this strategy marks, the, for me, a turning point in our community saying that, that we also embrace that as our vision of excellence. And at the end of the day, it's a lot to do with the narrative you place around how that excellence is achieved as well. So if we do focus on the lone genius model, then we're not telling an accurate story of who was involved in delivering excellence. Um, so I think that you know, a strategy can only do so much but actually it is a very, very significant step forward for us. So there've been a whole range of great questions that we've not been able to do justice to. Now, I'm reliably informed that those of you who've posted questions will get written answers because we won't have time to cover off more of them. I'm so sorry. Um, but I hope that you've enjoyed this opportunity to sort of look under the bonnet of the strategy and to hear more about the thoughts and the hopes that we have uh, that, are, that are embodied in that strategy. I think, I hope you've all heard that there is a real commitment to action 
this is not just about government action, this is also about community action. And here we have a cross section of national academies, uh, significant companies, um, universities, and of course, key funders. And we are just a, a small number of those who are now out there all committed to trying to drive positive change in this area. I think the fact we've had such great engagement from our audience, really thoughtful, intelligent questions, um, again, is another reason for optimism. And so I really look forward to the springboard being, uh, sorry, the strategy being a springboard for action um, so that we do move towards that uh, healthier, more sustainable, more inclusive R&D culture that we all believe is important so that we can welcome people from all parts of society and get the benefit of them being part of this incredible community. Um, so I'm going to now hand back to Amanda for final words. And I will also once again uh, say thank you, Amanda, for your leadership on this. Uh, this wouldn't have happened without you. So over to you to close things off. Well, thank you. I can't believe where the time's gone. I'm looking at the clock and isn't working. I thought it was still half 10, but anyway, thank you. Thank you so much. And I, I guess my, my first things are thank you to all the panelists here. It really has been fantastic. And Heaton, great, to, great to see you virtually and look forward to seeing you um, in real life very shortly. And thank you to all of you who have participated in this. It really is just so encouraging and just rec just shows us that this is so well needed. There's a couple of things I, I, I wanted just, just to mention. This is, uh, and I know I've said this a couple of times already, but this is the start of our journey. And please, all of you who have put comments in, all of you who have, um, have some, some thoughts on this, this doesn't stop here. Really, we do want to carry on here. All and any thoughts that, that that you have, and there are loads of really good things within the strategy. But as I say it's just a start point. Please do have a look at the strategy, and please do give us some um, some some further thoughts. I would also like to put a plea to everybody, people here, um, but also people listening who have the opportunity to make a difference and just say to you, you can make a difference. So please, please do that. It is incumbent on all of us, I believe, to really step forward and really just bring this, this people and culture strategy alive because this is the start of this and this needs to be done. I really do, um, really do believe that. Um, I said earlier, it's the right thing to do. I absolutely think it's the right, right thing to do. I do do have a final thank you and um, there's so much I could I could say but a final thank you to these amazing people that you can't see over here who have all been so fantastic I could come over and squish you but I guess that's not allowed but honestly you know you guys there it's not it's not I, I, you know I you know you, you guys are all fantastic there but they are absolutely amazing week in week out you've sat there looking at this getting the detail right really talking to people so mwah. Thank you to you, you are amazing. Thank you so much. Um, hi Alton, back to you. <laughs> I think that's that's the end of it. I mean, what can we say more than that? Uh, thank you so much all for joining us. And uh, we look forward to working with you to make all of the aspirations embodied in that strategy, the reality that we all experience each day of our lives. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you.